Well, we are beginning something new this morning, and uh, it is the idea of legacy. Um, this, this idea intrigues me because um, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, I looked at the, the formal definition, uh, like going online and uh, finding all the dictionaries and looking at it, and the idea of legacy was something that is transmitted or passed down, whether it's financial or whether it's something more than that, right? So you can have a, a legacy um, of a financial gift that you give down to your kids, um, but also because of cultural, because of different things, um, you know, you can leave a legacy of war and destruction. Um, you can leave a legacy of love and whatever it happens to be. Over the past week, um, our nation uh, saw two legacies on display, prominent legacies. One, John McCain, the other, Aretha Franklin. And I want to read some of the uh, lines that were spoken at their funerals about them. Uh, one person said of McCain, In one epic life was written the courage and greatness of our country. Someone else said, Some lives are so vivid it's difficult to imagine that they've ended. Some voices so vibrant and distinct it's hard to think of them stilled. A man who seldom rested is laid to rest. His absence is tangible and it's silence after, it's like the silence after a mighty roar. Of uh, Miss Franklin, it was said, she never relied on anyone else to tell her story. She wrote her own script. In the example she set both as an artist and a citizen, Aretha embodied those most revered virtues of forgiveness and reconciliation. While the music she captured, made captured some of our deepest human desires, namely of affection and respect, through her voice, her own voice, Aretha lifted those of millions, empowering and inspiring the vulnerable, the downtrodden, and everyone who may have just needed a little love. She was recognized, she specialized in singing that moved souls, stirred the spirit, and made us aware of a divine presence that could not be uh, denied. And in the midst of our nation's current crisis, we need again that gospel that Aretha sang. Some of you all may have watched um, parts of those different events. These were definitely two people, um, whether famous or infamous or however you saw them, um, that left a legacy that had an incredible sway that has affected millions of people, the way that they lived that out. And the reality is not all of us are so gifted. Not all of us are put into the same circumstances that we might rise above them. And yet, here is the reality, whether you are young or old, every one of you will leave behind a legacy. It may not affect a million people, but it's going to affect a household, which will have kids that might have more kids, and you will see your legacy continued on. It might be in your workplace and how you live out your workplace environment. It may be in your church and how you serve this church faithfully. We've seen some very faithful people of our congregation go on to be with the Lord this past year. And their fingerprints are still all over what has been accomplished here at EBC. And so this series, what we're going to be doing is diving in to key areas where Scripture speaks about maybe not leaving a legacy, but developing a godly legacy. One that has God at the center. One lived to God. One lived through God in accordance with the giftings and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing. I can't leave your legacy, nor can you establish mine. Every one of us are in this, but each of us has their own role to play, their own part in that journey. And so the question is, what does it look like, not just to leave a legacy, because we're here in a place of worship, what does it look like to leave a godly legacy? And I will tell you, there's a lot of things that you think in your mind, what would go into being a godly legacy? And the question is, how much of that are you applying to your life? How are you allowing what you know to affect what you do? 
And so we're going to be spending the next several weeks kind of pointing out different things, um, different key principles, concepts, challenges that would say to us, how are you establishing and developing your legacy? We have an opportunity to be used by God in great ways. And so therefore, whether you will come to find that you just need to tweak the sails a little bit to get to where you want to be, to see what God is doing, or if you need to do a total roundabout and start that ship over. Um, one of the things that I am reminded of is we do have short-term or short uh, attention spans at some level. Right? If you're a 40-year-old, um, we, we often don't necessarily remember all of the stuff up to 40 if you live to be 85 or 90. It's the things that we kind of see over that entire time. Those things still have the opportunity to progress and define us. And so regardless of where you find yourself, there's an opportunity that you have to develop a legacy that God would be honored by. So we're going to be in John chapter 5. And I want to read the first nine verses. And this is kind of an interesting passage um, to me. It, and really John chapter 9, 1 through, five, 1 through 9 sets up uh, some more context in that chapter. And we'll hit on it a little bit. But there's a central question that Jesus asks of the man uh, in the story. And I want to use it to kind of frame our conversation this morning as we think about what is legacy and what is my legacy? And how am I going to go about doing that? And so if you have your place, would you stand? We're going to read the first nine verses together. The Word of God says this. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews. Not, wasn't necessarily known what feast it was. He's not specific here. And Jesus goes up, went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition. He said to him, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool where the, when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. So Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. Will you pray with me? Lord, I pray that you would help us as we begin this investigation, this thought process, this time of evaluation into the idea of legacy and the opportunity that we have to be used by you to impact those around us and those beyond. Lord, I pray that this morning that your word would speak, that your spirit would um, illuminate truth, and the Lord, that I would um, submit even my own heart to what you have to say. Lord, we need you to speak. We need you to guide us. And so this morning as we ask a tough question, would you help us walk by grace and follow in obedience? Thank you for loving us, for the walk that you have us on, for the opportunities that you have set before us, um, whether that be our families, our work environment, our school environment, this church environment. Lord, for this community environment. May we be found faithful as we follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to walk through um, some different points. And what I want to talk about, this idea of growth. 
All right, if we're going to develop a godly legacy, then it's the idea of growth. And so we're going to look at some different things in this passage that really set the table for the conversation that we're going to have over the next couple months. And so as we walk through it, looking at this idea of growth, the first thing I want to point out is this. Growth requires us to change in our routine, our behavior, and our uh, responsibility. Growth requires change. Um, You cannot stay the same and say that you are growing. Those two things do not work together. To stay the same and to grow, right? Um, I've been watching my son, and he uh, has only stayed the same in the sense that uh, he is shorter than me when now ducking. There was a time where it was in question, was dad taller? And so the obvious answer was, duck, son, and yes, I will be, right? But growth has happened, and it's undeniable. He has not stayed the same, and I've had to acknowledge, and I went and got measured at the same time he did, and yes, he has me already by a quarter of an inch and half a shoe size, and so I have lost. There has been growth in his life, and it's been obvious. And in this case, think about this man for just a second. The predicament that this man has been in. He has been an invalid. We don't know exactly what it is, but it obviously has something to do with the fact that he does not have the ability to walk easily or well. And he's been that way for 38 years of life. His life has become defined by those limitations. No doubt, there have been countless times where he has laid poolside, never healed, and had to be dependent on others, both to move him and to provide for him. You see, the question that Jesus asks here, do you wish to be well? Do you wish to get well? Is a difficult question. And it's not as simple as we might take it, right? Most of us would say, yes, right? We would immediately jump to saying, yes, that's a dumb question. I want that, but it's not that simple, You see, this was a question that would have dramatic consequences on this man's life. This would require something to happen because if he gets healed, expectations and responsibilities are going to change. If he experiences healing, if he experiences growth, then there's going to be requirements now. People aren't going to provide for him as they did. They're not going to lift him up and carry him as they did because he is able to do those things and he won't be called upon to provide for himself. This question is a hard question. There are people that we know that we would ask this question and even though they might say yes, everything in them says no. There have been times where you may have asked that same question of yourself and you recognize, yeah, surely I want to grow. I want to I want to be better, but the answer is really, I don't know. I don't know if the costs are worth it. The other day, I was pulling off the interstate, and there was a homeless person sitting there. Um, I finally pulled up to the right spot where I could read the sign. And the sign wasn't, you know, down on my luck, just need a hand up, or, you know, something like that. It was... um, I'm part of a family living under the bridge here. Whatever you can do to help you know, would be greatly appreciated. I rolled down my window and I said, hey, I've got half a sub here. Would you like it? And his answer to me was, no, that's okay. I already had Subway today. And I just stopped. And I thought, okay, does he want the circumstance to change? He he sits at an intersection and he's taken care of. People provide. Now, I don't know his backstory, and I'm still getting enough guts to pull off one day and just sit down and talk to figure out what's going on. But I would contend that there's a lot of us in this room that are kind of the same way. All right, we, we've kind of developed a pattern, developed a lifestyle, 
And it may not be wonderful. It may not be all that it could be. But it's good enough for me. And so we've resigned ourselves to the fact that, no, I'm okay. I've already had Subway today. Because you see, answering that question meant that that life was going to be radically changed. And how many of us really want our lives radically changed? Even in the hurt, you will know there are people that are hurting, but it's what they know and what they're familiar with. And you wonder, why don't you leave that situation? Why don't you get out of that struggle? Why don't you address that problem? But it's because that's what they know. And it's not outside this room. It's inside this room. That there are things with which we struggle. There are things with which we battle. There are things that we know that are not right, that we need to address, that we need to deal with, that there could be so much more experience. But we would rather just say, you know what, Jesus, help the guy next to me. I'm okay. I've been here 38 years. Help that one over there. Now, we would not say it verbally. But is that how we live? Because growth is going to require us to change the status quo. And so the question really is to each of us, are we interested in that? If I'm going to spend the next couple of months talking about legacy and what it looks like to have a godly legacy, are we interested in conforming our lives to what Scripture calls us to? Are we interested in really growing? Or are we rather just comfortable where we are listening to a guy wave his arms around each week. And we like that, right? I was encouraged this past week. I met with the deacon leadership. And what I heard was an answer of yes. And I was excited about that. They said, we, we want to work with the deacons and we want to start there. And we want to see what God can do to those group of men who are supposed to be those who are examples and models for the church walking in a way that honors Christ. And so I'm looking forward to seeing what those men do. In fact, in your bulletin, um, I think that there is even an insert for nominating additional ones. So if you want to sign somebody else up for this um, growth process... That's not the reason you would sign them up. Um, but if you recognize God working in someone's life and you want to give us that name, man, we would love to connect with that person. Do you want to be well? It will change everything as you do that. Second point is this. To experience growth, we must lay down excuses. We must lay down excuses. You see, I, I don't know exactly how to take verse 7. Verse 7, um, when he is asked, do you wish to get well? The man says, look, I have no one to put me in. When the water moves, somebody else gets there first. Now, I don't know to take that as an honest, like, I'm trying with everything I got. And I'm just not fast because I can't walk. And they can't get me there fast. Of course I want to get well. Or do we take it kind of like we take some of the comments that we make. We know the right answers. And so we say the right answers. But we're not really that invested in those answers. Right? We might say, yes, we would love to be healed. But this is where I'm going with this. Is if he has relied on somebody to put him in the water for 38 years. Stop and think with me for just a second on this. If that was you, at some point, would you not try something else? 38 years. Oh, we were too slow again. No. I mean, I'm, I'm creating some type of jerry-rigged contraption hovering just above the water's surface. Put me on it. When you see the water, yank the cord. Boom, I'm in first. Right? I mean, I... I'm not going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get a tag team of group of guys, and they're going to be big guys. All right, everybody get a leg or an arm, right? We're watching. And check me. I mean, I mean, I'm thinking, how can I get this done? 38 years. And what is his answer? Well, you know, I would have gotten in the water. But no one lifts me up, and someone always beats me. 
is it really, is that really valid after 38 years? Maybe after week one. But at what point do we say, are we just blowing smoke? How many of us have answers? And really, we're just, we, we know how to sound good because we're, we're Jesus people, right? If I had a guy who could put up a Jesus sign, then I, you know, we know the right answer, right? That's, oh, look, there it is. We, we know the right answers. And we say them. But I just wonder, are they really just excuses? Are they things to allow us to stay where we are rather than to grow. And let me just say this. This is not uncommon to man, right? Go back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 3, right? Adam, what have you done? What was his? Well, Lord, I, I've really blown it. I apologize. I, I've sinned before you. No, no, that was not his answer. It was her, Right? Oh, we go for excuse. I mean, we learned, we, we started that way. It was her and then her. It was it, right? And then it got cursed, right? I mean, we passed it along quickly. Moses, when God says, okay, I'm now ready to send you, what do you say? Well, I, I, I can't really talk real well. Right? Exodus chapter 4. I, you know, I'm slow of speech. I got a problem. Right? And finally God says, oh, then I'm sending Aaron and you're going to go together. But you're going. Right, we, we are good at coming up with excuses every time we can. Proverbs 26, 13, I love this verse. The sluggard says, there's a lion in the road. There's a lion in the streets. Right? I'm not leaving the house. I might get chewed up. Right? Seriously, there's a lot of people that get out and don't get eaten by lions every day. Right? It's probably not the best answer, but to a sluggard, it's going to be, well, it sounds good. Would you want to go out there if there's a lion? Not me. I'd rather just stay here. I'm safe. What excuses are you throwing out there? I think of McCain and Franklin. If you go back and look at their, their stories, um, they would have multiple excuses to list why they could have never done or been what they were. For Franklin, her parents divorced at an early age. Her mother died when she was 10. She dropped out of school after the ninth grade. For McCain, he was a military kid, went to 20 different schools as he grew up. Always, everywhere, somebody, somewhere different. He goes into military himself, ends up a POW for five and a half years, tortured. Even at one point, offered release because of his rank and because of his, who his dad was and refused it because that was the correct military code. And so he stayed for five and a half years in and to the day he died, could not raise his arm above his shoulder because of how many bones had been broken and how he'd be, been disfigured. And yet, and yet. You know those people that just cling to the excuse and allow the excuse to define them? And it becomes a box that they can be not just uh, kept safe inside, but limited and controlled guess what? Every one of you have the opportunity to make excuses for your life. And you know what? Some of yours might sound really valid. But with God, things are different. And God can change lives. And we live in a country that allows us, by the grace of God, to do a whole lot of things different. But listen to just some of these encouraging reminders from Scripture. Ephesians 3.20 and 21, now to him who is able to do far abundantly beyond all we can ask or think according to the power that works within us, to, be, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations. To him who can do far more abundantly beyond all we can ask or think according to the power that works within us. Philippians 4.13, often misquoted, but I'll put it in context. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The idea of being able to take any kind of circumstance and still have contentment in Christ. 1 John 4.4, 4, you are from God, little children. You've overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the 
world. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity but a power and love and discipline. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. New things have come. Guess what? The excuses are only a rejection of the promises. How long are we going to hide? There's a lot of truth that's poured over you in Scripture. That verse the other two weeks ago that we memorized. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement, it just rings through my head because we need that. We need to be reminded of these promises because too quickly we believe all the excuses. Do you really wish to be well? Then it requires you to lay down the excuses that you've always given. And so what are the excuses that you're lying, that are, you're hiding behind? What have you allowed to define your inability to grow? What are the subtle ways that the enemy has deceived you, whether it's to question or to doubt or just absolutely ignore God's transformative power in your life? Third thing is this. Our true growth must come from Christ, not somewhere else. True growth has to come from Christ, not somewhere else. It's very interesting. Jesus says, do you wish to get well? The man doesn't look back up and Jesus says, yes, can you heal me, please? Now, he has an excuse. If you look down in verse 13, he didn't know who Jesus is. No clue. He just had this, maybe a punk, come and say, man, you really want to be well? Who are you? Seriously? Why do you think I lay here? Right? He doesn't necessarily get it. He doesn't necessarily understand it all. But ultimately, we have that answer. We know that that comes from Jesus. You see, back then there, there was a lot of superstition regarding that pool. In fact, verse 3 and 4, it's, it's really kind of debated whether they weren't in the original manuscripts. Um, they were added to kind of clarify verse 7 and his answer. And so if you look at it, though, there's, there's superstitions that abounded back then. And what happened was in this particular pool that it was fed by what they believe an, an, like an underground spring that would occasionally bubble up. It had kind of a reddish tint to it because of some of the metal in the water that was there. And so they believed that was medicinal. And so they, there were these beliefs that, oh, if the water moves on its own, evidently that's an angel that's done this. There were all kinds of different beliefs out there. There's a lot of superstition regarding different things. And so they looked to the water for healing. They believed that it was the thing that did it. But yet today we now know that that answer is Jesus. And the question that we have is how often do we turn to him for growth? How often do we really go to Jesus for growth? How often do we instead go to self-help books or we go to medicine, or we go to philosophy, or we go to cultural opinion. Well, that's what the doctors say. Well, that's what the, the wise people say. Well, that's what the you fill in the blank say. And we're so quick to receive those things, and we let those things define the answers that we're like, well, that's how we grow. We got to connect with this, this, and this. And what we don't do is we don't go to God and we don't go to His Word and we don't rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to produce those things. And that that's what, this is what Jesus shows up on the scene and says. You think the waters. No, it's not the waters. I will speak to you. And I will call you in my power to rise up. What do you go to? What do you lean on? What are the voices that you have given that authority in your head? And do you want to grow and have a godly legacy? Then guess who you need to start with? God. If it's a godly legacy. Now, if you want a worldly legacy, then you hook yourself up to world ideology. But if you are a believer and you desire for God to reign in your life, to get the glory, to lead you, then you must 
naturally and first and foremost go there. We have to go to Scripture and say, what does Scripture say about what we're talking about? How does it inform us? How does it direct us? How does it rebuke us? Maybe from something that we thought was correct. This is one reason that I'm focusing on verses about the Holy Spirit this week. Because one of his roles is to lead us into all truth. And to give us that power, that that ability to be able to actually grow. You see, if we are told that we must grow, we have to seek Christ. Growing in godliness and fellowshipping in Christ. Those two things go hand in hand. And so my question would be to you, if you were to judge your desire for spiritual growth by your fellowship with Christ, do you wish to get well? If you were to look at how you're investing in God's Word and spending time in prayer and relying upon His strength, Where would you be on a 10-point scale about growing? Would you be, man, I'm, I'm seeking God because I know that it's in Him and in Him alone that I can be transformed by the renewing of my mind? Or is it, man, I really would like that. Right? I'm running again for this marathon thing. And I can really want to finish under four hours, which is my goal. I can really want that. Oh, it's just, and, and I can read books even about that. But I have to actually put my, my confidence in actually doing something about it. Going and working. True and lasting godly growth comes from Christ, nowhere else. Answering the question, do you seek him, answers the question, do you wish to get well. Fourth point. Our growth is a display of the power of God in our lives. Man, I love this idea. Our growth is a display of the power of God in our lives. Uh, MacArthur says this, Having been incurably ill for nearly four decades, this man provided Jesus with an opportunity to, to display his divine power. And here's how I want to apply that to you. Think about this for just a second. If you are messed up, if you have struggles, if there are things with which you are dealing, then just as Jesus graciously looked at that man and brought healing, so he can do it for you. The man responds by getting up and walking in light of the miracle performed. And therefore, he literally becomes a walking testimony of the power of God. Some of us have been laying around as spiritual invalids for decades. Right? If we were to admit it and be honest, and the reality is, isn't it time, about time for God to get the glory in your life? 2 Corinthians 4, 6, and 7 says this, For God who said, light shines, shall shine out of the darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And then he goes on to say, but we have that treasure, this treasure in earthen vessels so that their surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. Man, do you realize that you are an opportunity to display the greatness and the power and the glory of God? Whether something is absolutely awry You can be used by God by the way that you surrender to him and allow him to work and bring restoration, reconciliation, healing, redemption, whatever it happens to be, and you can be a walking billboard for the power of Jesus Christ. That means regardless of who you are and what situation you're in, regardless of how work is going, how school is going, how your marriage is going, how your family life with your kids is going, right now you have the opportunity to surrender that to to Jesus Christ, and by his power become a billboard for what God can do in someone's life. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, that as you receive the comfort, you are then used by the God of all comfort to comfort others. You become a walking reminder of hope to people. Because you would say, man, if they could do it in my, if he could do it in my life, He can do it in yours. 
Have you let God be on display in the way that you have surrendered in your life and let God grow you and your family, your work environment, whatever it happens to be? Would you say, I am a display of God's grace? As you move on, I would, I'm going to say this. Growth happens through application. Growth happens through application. See, the man, it says in verse 8, get up, your, uh, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. And it says, immediately the man became well, picked up his pallet and walked. All right. So here's the deal. He gets up and he walks. There are so many things that we know to be true and haven't applied them. Can, can you imagine, can you imagine this guy? Jesus says, you are healed. And he sits on his mat. And he says, praise the Lord, I have been healed. This is awesome. Isn't it awesome that what God can do? And he just sits there. I mean, would you imagine him doing it? I mean, can you imagine him actually doing that? That would be, you'd think, are you silly? Are you dumb? What, what is it? What is the disconnect here, bud? You're healed. Get up and walk. He's told you to get up and walk. But guess what? He's just like us. Because how many times have you read something to be true about who you are in Christ? Or what you've been given by God. And just sat there and said, oh, isn't that awesome? Oh, praise the Lord. And didn't do a thing with it. Oh, that's a true statement. Let me just, oh, I'm going to memorize that one. The man grew because he got up and he walked. Like he, he trusted what he has been said and he walked in light of it. Are you willing to read Scripture and to walk in light of what it says? Are you willing to actually say, hey, that's what I'm supposed to do? That's who God has made me to be? Okay, I'll do it. Or do we just sit there and we sing the great songs about what we got, but we don't actually let it sink in and, and apply to our lives at all? There's application. It's a requirement. It's one thing just to know a bunch of stuff. It's a whole nother thing to put that into practice. I think of a, a couple examples. Um, <clears throat> go to James chapter 1. You know this passage well. In James chapter 1, James talks about this idea of putting it into practice. Starting in verse 20, well, I'll start in 22. It says, but prove yourselves to be a doer of the word and not merely a hearer who deludes themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. I mean, think about how crazy that idea is. James is saying, you looked in a mirror have you forgotten what you look like? No. And yet you'll look into Scripture and you'll just read it and not live in light of it. Right? If I look in the, in the mirror and I have a booger, i got to deal with that. I can walk along and not deal with it, but it really gets embarrassing for everybody else around me. I don't forget that. I take care of business. Right? When I look into God's law, look what he says. He continues on. He says, but the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. It's a call to application and not to just stay the same. Two illustrations, one from um, Israel you know of the Dead Sea, right? You've heard of the Dead Sea. It's, it's the lowest elevation on the planet. The Jordan River funnels down to it, and as a result, it has no outlets. And so because of that, 
It is one of the most salty, well, it is the saltiest um, landlocked bodies of water. In fact, I haven't gone over there yet. I, I want to go over there someday. But I, I'm told basically it's almost at a point where you just kind of get in the water and you just kind of float because there's, it's so dense with salt. It's nine times saltier than the ocean. Nah. I've, I've caught a couple waves in my day. Nine times saltier? Um, that's a lot of salt. Things don't grow in it. That's why it's called the Dead Sea. Yeah, yeah you caught on. It's good. It's not like Greenland and Iceland. No, we went straight at it this time, right? It's the Dead Sea. And it had, and this is what they said, here is the problem. It has no outlets. So everything just comes in. And the only thing that gets absorbed is really just the, the water. And so everything else just kind of stays there and sits. You ever seen a sponge? It's good at soaking up water, isn't it? You ever left it in your kitchen sink? What happens to that sponge that you didn't wring out and set up nicely? Yeah, my wife, what happens to it is it goes into the garbage. In mine, I'm like, salvage it. Come on, man. Put soap into it and scrub it you know, several times. Wash it over and over again. Because what happens, it starts to stink. And there's a reason for that. The sponge takes it in, but if it's going to be really effective and it's going to continue to be useful, you have to wring it out. Well, guess what? If you were a sponge and you were being wringed out all the time, would it feel good? Not necessarily. But it would keep you useful for the purposes that you've been created. And I think sometimes what we do instead is we come in here like sponges. We come in here like a reservoir ready to receive. And we just take it in. We just take in more knowledge. You've heard this message. You decide whether you liked it or you didn't. Right? You let me know when, I walk, when you walk out. Right? That's how it kind of works. But the question is, do you, do you then wring it out? Do you apply it in your life? Or do you stink? In, in, I think it's 2 Corinthians where the aroma of Christ, we're supposed to smell like Christ. But some of us smell like religion. And just a bunch of head knowledge. And we've lost grace. And we're really good at judgment. We've forgotten what the cross has meant in our own lives. And we don't have hope for anybody else because we've condemned them. We've taken the message of the gospel and we've saturated our lives with it. Praise God, I'm free! We've never given it away to anybody else. Genesis, when God comes to Abram, he says, I'm going to bless you and through you all the nations will be blessed. We're to be a conduit for blessing so that as we receive we then pour out to others we are not to be a reservoir a holding tank we remain fresh and alive as those things move to us and then through us you want to know how to jump start your spiritual walk if you feel a little dead if you feel a little kind of blah go love someone in the name of christ Go, go see someone in struggle and help them. Go share the gospel where there isn't a gospel presence. And you will see something happen in you. Because that blessing that you've just held on to, you watch someone else be blessed by it or illuminated by it. And you get excited about it. And so the blessing actually comes back to you the other way and you continue and it charges you. But if you just sit week after week, it doesn't happen. Growth requires us to do something about that which we know. It causes us to move. So the question remains, do you wish to be well? We have received, every one of us in this room have received more than we apply already. We know more than we have applied. And so our growth for many of us at this point is 
now dependent upon us taking up our pallet and walking in the power that Jesus has supplied. Living well, leaving a godly legacy means that we need to apply that which we know and have been given by God. It's a gut check moment. Do we take the things that we have heard and say, okay, God, now move me. Let me walk in light of this. Let me hit two quick ones real real fast and we'll close. The sixth one is this. Growth may come in a way that you don't expect. Well, if you look at John chapter 5, the whole point of John chapter 5 isn't just this guy's question, do you wish to be well? I realize that. I'm pulling that out to focus on it. Ultimately, though, it gets to this question of the Sabbath and Jesus working in a way that the religious people said he's not allowed to work. And I think sometimes we expect and we define how God is allowed to work. It has nothing to do with Scripture. It has all to do with us and our maybe worldly experience. And we just decide that's it. And so here we are and we say, God, you will work like this. You will work through these avenues, through this mechanism. And then when God shows up and works in a different way, we reject it and we despise it because it wasn't how we thought it should have happened. And yet God was having, had a whole other track, a whole other trajectory that he wanted to take us on. And we said, no, because that's not the way I want to go. That's not the way I see you, God. It's not the way I expect you to work. And so therefore, I will discount it and I will move away from it. Too often, God will work that way. Healing in the, on the Sabbath is something that ends up, instead of being celebrated with this man, the Jews, by verse 16, are seeking to persecute Jesus. And by verse 18, they want to kill him all And you have a rejection of what God has done. Miss the whole point. Growth may come in ways that you don't expect. And so my question to you is, how is God moving in your lives? How does he want to move in your life? It may not look like what you expect. But Moses saw him in the gentle breeze. The final thing, which is, Kind of a scary one to end on. But here's the reality. You can reject growth. You can reject it. These Jews did. But ultimately, this man kind of does as well. You see, if you follow the story of this man, you continue to read the story. He doesn't know who heals him. So he gets attacked by the religious people saying, who, who told you to pick that pallet up? Who told you to walk? He's like, I don't know. And that was, a, that was an honest answer. He didn't know. He says, I don't know who told me to do it. He, the guy slipped off. It's kind of an exciting moment, you know. I don't know where he went. I wasn't really excited about it. I wasn't really focused on that. I was excited by the fact that I was using my legs. And I had the strength to be able to do what I was doing. I didn't see it. You think, well, man, this guy's been transformed. So Jesus finds him after that moment and says, hey, it was me. My name is Jesus. I'm the one that did that. Now, go, don't sin anymore that anything worse might befall you. And so what does the man do? He goes and tells on him. Yeah, verse 15. He goes and reports back to the Jews. It was Jesus. Is this guy named Jesus? Go get him. And that's the last we hear of this guy. He was transformed physically. But spiritually, I have no idea where his heart was. All right, we can come in here, we can talk a bunch of talk. But ultimately, we can reject that. We can walk away from it. That's a very real possibility. And so this morning, as we prepare to continue in this study on legacy and living life by what matters most, when we're going to be confronted by the things that matter most, my question to you is, you will, are you willing to grow in that? That's why I wanted to start just asking, are you ready to take a journey with me? Doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. But are you willing to try it? Are you willing to see what God can do? Are you ready to watch 
and allow God to make you a display of his glory.